What's going on, you guys? It's your Huggable Hipster here, and welcome back to Aesthetically Techie, the podcast where we discuss business and gaming, technology and gaming, important issues in gaming, just everything surrounding gaming right now. And today I have a really special guest with me. I'd like to welcome Nathalie Lawhead, and she's actually, I, I always get confused. Is your, like, I saw the TH in there, and I was like, is it Natalie or Nathalie? I hope I'm not pronouncing your name incorrectly. <laughs> it's, it's Natalie, but I, I'm not picky. Like, everyone says a different thing, but it's oh, kind of fun, so. <laughs> <laughs> and she is actually a multidisciplinary uh, game designer, which I th- that was actually a pretty cool title. I was like, when you introduce yourself to people, you're like, yes, I am a multidisciplinary <laughs> game designer. Thank you. <laughs> but it's so good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. So today we're going to be talking about a range of topics, and I should actually preface this by we got into a discussion actually quite a bit ago whenever I heard your podcast with another person, which I'll link that podcast down below so you guys can see it as well. For those of you who are watching this on YouTube and for those of you who are listening to the podcast on Spotify, hello to you all as well. Um, we're going to be going into the discussion of accountability in gaming journalism in that industry because this needs to be discussed. Mm-hmm. More people need to hear about it. And it's a topic that quite frankly, it's not talked about enough. And I feel like now that we are sitting down and we're talking about it, I feel like that more ears will get to hear it and know more about it. So the first thing that I want to kind of go into is kind of this power hungry attitude within the industry that I know that you've noticed, I've noticed, I want to get your take on how you've seen things, especially like right now surrounding what's going on in different articles that we're seeing with Kotaku and all of that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, it it's such a huge topic, you know, like, the, I, I think power is a big problem here, especially with how people approach the serious topics when they write about it. And I think there, like, it's been very eye opening to me to, to be kind of taken advantage of and to see how little it, it, people care. Because when, it, when I came forward with this, a bunch of other people came forward to me talking about their experience about how they were taken advantage of by a journalist for some serious stories, you know, and sharing how their story was not properly reflected and just basically liberties with the truth were taken and, and, and relaying that. So it's kind of like you start seeing like, well, then who, how can you rely? How, where's the hope here? Because if it, uh, survivors are being taken advantage of by the powerful people in the game space that have power, and then survivors are being taken advantage of by the powerful people in journalism. There's like there's really literally no hope here for any change if some if there's no real ethical discussion or standards and. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of rambling, but it's been really kind of shocking to see how the big name people that I thought stood for something actually stand for very little. And the bigger they are, the more they will take advantage of people and can get away with it, you know, which kind of said, so, you know, like you used to think, like, if they're big, they can't afford to fuck up. No, if they're big, they can very much afford to fuck up and take advantage of you. Yeah, so exactly. It's an entire mentality, too, because, like, I remember, and just to preface this, you know, the reason why, um, for those of you who are listening to this, why I'm mentioning Kotaku is because um, Natalie uh, puts a tweet out every single day asking them to take accountability, and it's one of the most, I have to say, amazing things that I've ever seen because it's like nobody really does that. (laughs) You know, you see survivors and you see all of these uh, different kinds of people from all walks of life just think that, well they're going to get their karma. Eh, they're not going to get mm-hmm. karma unless they're, you know, really brought up on it every single day, which I think, uh, you know, it's really amazing that you're doing that, by the way. Thank, Thank you. you. That means a lot to know because it, it's it's not easy to speak up about stuff like this, you know, like uh, just coming forward about my assault was hard enough, you know, like that. that's kind of like the kind of thing that your entire life will fall apart, you know, and so you have to get past that. And then what, what's okay so what's really fucked up about this entire situation too is like okay you come forward about assault about someone very powerful a journalist will come in and take advantage of that and really really brutally prey on that 
what are you going to do? Are you now going to out the journalists? Like how much, how many people do you have to out here? Because it starts making you look, you look like you make up stuff about people, you know, like it places you in a position where you have to constantly fight for your legitimacy and that this is true. So yeah, I, I call, uh, so like, it, it's it kind of like, it, 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 it's so bad where you have to keep confronting people about this now, you know, and just the fact that Kotaku can do something like this and then in the next round of Me Too's act like they care and that they're allies, like, no, you don't get to do that anymore. You have to care about the people you hurt. You have to make this right. Because it's just, it's really fucked up, like, to see you speak up, a bunch of guys are going to uh, say, yeah, I support you, that's terrible. And then you get DMs from people that were hurt by those guys saying, yeah, he, he stood up for a rapist, yeah, he did something similar to me. So it's like, there's so much of this in the game space and apparently in game journalism that it's it's just an epidemic and like it's it's got to stop. And we, I feel like the most hope we have is just to keep saying stuff and not taking it anymore, you know, even if it makes you feel like shit because like, what, what else do you have? Because they take your story and slaughter it and then they benefit from your silence. Like there's a point where it's just, it's enough, you know? Exactly. And that's like on, you know, and it's bewildering because as someone who writes for games and who does basically freelance journalism, like, first of all, I want to apologize on behalf of, behalf of journalists, because I think it's really important to say that not all journalists are like the writer that you experienced, mm -hmm. you know, there are some good ones out there. And there are people who want to hear your story and want to take full accountability for everything. There are journalists like Cecilia, who I am going to mention, because I feel like it's very pivotal that we do mm -hmm. mention her name that way she does get not necessarily clout because this is not about clout whatsoever it's about having her take responsibility for what she's done which is negative and it's made it's actually made it worse for the survivor mm -hmm. it's made it worse for the person who's just trying to heal from everything so it's it's really damaging i think so to go into something that it's you know kind of uncharted territory with what you're doing i think that not only it's crucial but it's important that people see that yeah, uh, what was it? I, I mean, I mentioned already, like when I came forward about what they did, other people uh, contacted me sharing their experiences. And like, this is serious stuff. These are extremely vulnerable people who don't have a voice. And a journalist can just come in, take advantage of their vulnerability and kind of like their weakness. And nothing, it's fine. There's no, there's no amount of accountability for that. There's nothing to keep them from doing that. And then people share these stories thinking they're getting the truth and they're they're not. It's like a spin on the truth. It's uh, someone's opinion about what happened, a very poorly informed opinion. Like, how can you get a truth about some about a predator if you placed the survivor in that kind of position, lied to them, squeezed them for information, yelled at them and were, were dishonest about the intention of what you're going to do? Like how? How is that going to reflect the truth? Because if you really want it, you have to be honest about what you're going to write, which didn't happen in any of the cases that I heard about it, or mine, you know, and the fact that you keep doing this to people, you, that you did this to people before doing it to me, it costs someone to nearly lose their life. And then you go on and do the exact same thing to me. And you're aware of what your behavior did. Like that is so fucked up. You can't do that. That's that's not that's not worthy of being called accountability journalism because if your accountability journalism cannot hold itself accountable, like what is that? It's 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 ridiculous. It is and the fact that they just keep on tweeting like it's normal, like nothing happened, like they they didn't state like put in any statements, they didn't take any accountability for the writers, and I feel like that's that, that's very very yeah dangerous. because they can just go on and do it to the next person and the next person is going to be told, well, everyone knows Kotaku's fucked up. What were you doing talking to them? Well, they don't know because everyone's retweeting them. Everyone's acting like it's fine. Yes. No big deal. They're going to trust them and they're going to get hurt because like I came forward about this. People come in, tell me everyone knows Kotaku's fucked up. Like I did not know. I saw all my friends and all my peers tweeting their stuff, sharing their stuff, joining the discourse they create. I, I thought they're safe. I thought they stood for something. And then they do this and you you speak up about it and everyone comes in going, it's like a range of, you know, fairly selfish reactions from shut up, uh, 
distancing themselves because they want to be written about on Kotaku and they don't want you to drag them down to people to educating you that Kotaku is really fucked up and you should have known better. Like, no, the person that got hurt did not know. It's not like they intentionally placed themselves in that situation. The fact that you're sharing them and not mentioning at all about their abusive history is also on you. It's a, it's a community issue. Abuse is a community problem and it takes a community to cover for an abuser. And that's kind of what we keep having in games. We cover for the abusive outlets. We cover for the abusive uh, companies, the the individual abusers. It's like it's, we have to come to a point where that's not tolerable anymore because like, I think we benefit from losing survivors and benefit from their silence because people that were hurt, they end up leaving. They're the ones that get canceled. The people that are doing the harm don't. They stay and they benefit from uh, being platformed and defended and all that. So it's like we, the very culture we have is incredibly toxic and it keeps breaking people and it's got to stop, you know? I, I completely agree with that. And it's, it almost like, you know, it's, it's something of where I think that it's, unfair and it's unjust and it's something of where I even actually mentioned in the article that I wrote about this situation of where for example I stated someone like me who has mm -hmm. morals you know who has you know a, <clears throat> excuse me an unbiased look towards things who actually like tries to take care of the like the person or topic that they're writing about gets pushed aside but the person who like completely is derogatory and selfish and mean they yeah. get pushed to the front so it's it's a really twisted mindset of how everything is done right now in gaming journalism yeah I, it, it's it was really shocking to me too because like you can't find the you can't find much about these people like my mom blames herself because my mom looked into cecilia and saw okay she's cool like she didn't find all the other stuff only afterwards you find all the other stuff because all the other stuff is way too much insider knowledge you know like it's it's also on the people that know about this and don't say anything that that's the issue it's the same with you know like uh, abusers and rapists in the game space people know that someone is problematic you only hear about it after they've hurt you that that that's a serious yeah. issue you know yeah exactly and that actually uh kind of segues into the next topic that we're going to be discussing of the corruption in the industry this is of where situations get taken too far without care for the other side that they're hurting. And I actually uh, saw something recent that was going on in the game space where a female who was a player in Overwatch in the league, I think in the, it was the, the China League, uh, if I'm not mistaken, she left because of the harassment that was going on. And I don't see this happening, you know, no offense to the males out there, but I don't see this happening a lot with the males whenever they go into a, a space for gaming. It kind of just happens to a lot of females who are trying to make a name for themselves, whether it be in the big leagues like Overwatch or what, you know, you're doing with game development or what I'm doing with game journalism. Yeah, we keep pushing out the people that get hurt because we're not willing to really listen to why they're being abused because I don't know, why why can't we hold abusers accountable? Why is it like it, it's so wild to me how you will see this dynamic of someone coming forward about something. It's a very serious allegation. There's proof, there's screenshots, there's text messages like they go out of their way to prove it. People posture solidarity and uh, the guy you know mutes what what do you call it what you know he goes dark on social media for a while then then he comes back right, exactly, and uh, yeah. it's fine you know people forgot about it and it's it's even more unbelievable to me that they get solidarity from other guys and they get even more opportunities exactly. and more publishers and they get more because of the abuse allegations the survivor on the other hand is kind of viewed as tainted and it ends up being silently pushed out like that, that it just says that abuse here is so common that the people at the top themselves are abusers that they'll look up for other abusers and like it's it's basically shameless you know yeah and it, it it's it gets me so upset at times because it's like whenever you see 
a community. It, it's been, like the gaming community is basically supposed to mm-hmm. just be a community where people can enjoy themselves, where people can play games and actually like coexist in this kind of I don't know mm-hmm. paradise if you will but the entire idea now has been tainted because of I want to say for lack of a better yeah. term schmucks like these you know they 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 come in and they're just like oh, okay we're powerful we have choice we have influence we have everything under the sun so they use that Yeah to their they advantage. can basically do whatever they want it's 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 really interesting too like because games are supposed to be fun. They're supposed to be about fun. Like, what the hell happened? How do they become this pretentious, egotistic, abusive space where you have to be so careful and look after each other and give GDC advice where, like, yeah, cover your drinks and be careful about being alone? Like, like what is that? It's supposed to be a safe space, you know? And it's it was really interesting to me to, to see, like, what's going on in Hollywood versus what's going on in games. Like Hollywood itself seems to have gotten its act cleaned up much more. I'm not, not defending like this is still fucked up, but it's publicly much more outgoing about something being wrong or like about how important diversity is. Like you see Netflix has all these shows now pushing black people, uh, women, queer people like, like, that seems to have left more of a mark on film than all the discussions of abuse had on games. Like the ones about games, it's almost cool to be abuser. And it's, it's, it's like, it made very little difference. And I mean, you, you, you can argue about the, the um, comparison I just made, but like, to me, it really seems like games do not take this serious just because of how normal and cool it is to hurt people. Yeah, exactly. And that's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that, too, because there was an article that came out about how the gaming industry makes more than movies mm-hmm. and TV shows combined. It's a multi-billion dollar industry so, uh, industry, so you would think that more care will be put into the games industry right now because of how much, you know, so ever since Xbox Series X and PS5 came out, how hyped it is currently with everything that's going on. I mean, this year, I think, was the biggest year for gaming, not just with all the news that came out with Cyberpunk, with everything that came mm-hmm. out with all the console releases. In general, gaming has an influence and I feel like it's turned it. <clears throat> excuse me. It's turned into something where if you know someone, you'll oh, succeed and you'll be yeah. safe and you'll be just fine. If, yeah. And if you don't know someone and you're starting out fresh, or if you're doing your own thing, if you're an indie developer, mm-hmm. you gotta watch your back. And that's such a kind of a cruel yeah, way. Yeah, but that's to look absolutely the case. If you know people on the inside, especially in bigger places you you'll be fine you know if you're starting out and especially if you stand for something and you're advocating for justice then then it's like watch your back uh be careful don't go to certain places you get kind of silently iced out like it, it's so fucked up and like i remember the very first game company i worked at uh my boss i, I worked very much with like the people that founded the company my boss was like, uh, I rem- a discussion really stuck to me. He was talking about how one other first person shooter triggered PTSD and war veterans, very serious PTSD. And he was talking about that fondly as if it would be so cool if our game could trigger guys like that. Like that was literally his outlook. Like he's what, like th- it was, uh, it was like, uh, a medal for them to be so real that you've triggered someone to want to die. So contrasting that, I feel like the way I've been treated by a game journalist, Kotaku specifically, the gist I get is like, do they think it's cool that their writing has had such a severe impact on someone that they wanted to die? Like, is, is, that, is that what we're going for here? That it's great if you have this kind of pretentious, gritty thing going on where you want to hurt people because that's real somehow, you know? And we were promised accountability. Where was that? Because there were eight sources. Uh, well, a broader, uh, broader thing about this too is like, um, my, the person that hurt me, uh, whatever the rapist, he has a history of shady business dealings. He, he ripped off his Kickstarter people. Like he, it wasn't a secret when I came out that this person's trash. And all the writing that took place about, you know, when I came forward, 
Um, not, not one of them mentioned his shady business dealings, his, uh, the way he ripped off his Kickstarter, like all the other stuff you could put under a microscope because someone came forward about something serious. I, on the other hand, were, was very publicly drug out and put under question and, uh, because, uh, me coming out caused someone else to come out who was in the person, the other abusive person that was outed committed suicide. It became the narrative now that me coming out caused someone to get uh, kill themselves and that that was that was so common now and it made it into the worst of the year, year lists for journalists of that year like the next web wrote about it like that they told the narrative of i came out with someone it caused someone to kill themselves someone completely unrelated to my story but you know like that's what reiterated and now gamers feel empowered to come after me because i'm responsible for someone's death which i'm not but like this is the narrative that got told and the way the, these predators got downplayed and basically portrayed as victims is extremely telling about the type of people that write the news about this. So we can't have accountability if the very people that write about it are themselves predators and abusers. Like it's, it's a, it's kind of like a, a atmosphere where something has to break in order for anything to change. You know, I, I feel like it's first of all that is so incredibly sad because it's like that person felt the courage to come out mm -hmm. with their story because you had the courage to come out with their story and I, I feel like it's so really disgusting and dirty how someone can take advantage of that not only through a medium in which you you spoke on your story you made everything very clear and then they took advantage of the person who was coming out yeah. with their story through you if that makes sense so it was kind of like a double thing that they were working on there and i honestly if any journalist out there is listening right now please just honor the person that you're talking with make sure that they feel safe because some like uh, things like this happen conversation happens it's going to have to get easier for everyone else you know because it's someone has to start you know it's kind of like uh I, when i wrote my open letter to game journalists i i mentioned at the ending uh for, there was whatever some kind of organization um had a guideline for uh writing about rape and they had an example of uh, for I'll, I'll paraphrase heavily, but they had an example for a company, uh, a country where rape was so common when the journalists made an industry about writing about rape and they benefited from the fact that rape was happening, you know, because it was so common. So that was kind of used as an example of like, don't benefit from the suffering. Try to be a change. Try to push for some for a better conversation to happen, because that's kind of like what we have in games now. When Jason Schreier writes about crunch, he's benefiting from writing about crunch. Crunch is just as good for Jason Schreier as it is for the abusive companies. Jason Schreier himself is not making a difference for the employees who have to crunch. And like, it's it's interesting to me, like a lot of these big journalists, when I read their articles, I'm like, they're not really confronting the core issue here of why crunch or why abuse is happening. They're just kind of writing about it and making clout for themselves. And like, that that that's the issue you but you benefit from abuse here and you benefit from writing abuse about abuse cecilia benefited from writing about my rape and she benefited from writing about the other story like it, that that helped her it did not help us it hurt us it caused us a tremendous amount of pain the way we were drug out the other story i that's the last post i just mentioned where i i, I gave examples of how, how she treated them and how you know, she basically lied about the intentions of what she's going to do, too. And that was a story where what the last Me Too, she posted as, as, as saying something along the lines of uh, thanking the people for coming forward and solidarity for them. And here's what I wrote for the stream, whatever, a streamer thing. Like, But that is a story where she abused the people for it, too. So she benefited from abuse just as much as anyone else here. So, and that's the problem. If you're a journalist benefiting from abuse, not trying to be a solution to anything other than it gives you some kind of big deal for your career, like you're no better. Like you, you're just, you might as well know the evil abusive bosses that are exploiting their employees and plotting with them to how to exploit it so you can write about it. That's not an, I'm exaggerating, you know. But it's that bad. Like, it's it's just, it's unbelievable to me how you can do this to people who trusted you, who gave you the, 
put put themselves in a very precarious position just talking to you and then you do this to them it's it's like how how is that journalism it's not and it's it's one of the very major factors that guide a lot of people especially like in the path that they take whenever they're a journalist you know do they Mm -hmm. want success right away do they want something that's instant you know instant gratification as you know my parents like to call it but that comes at a price if they want instant gratification within their work you know they literally (laughs) for no you know no pun intended but they have to sell Mm -hmm. their soul to the devil a little bit over here and not in the best way and they're going about it in such a a conniving way of where like they, they focus more on like the cloud of their job position i feel than the actual authenticity that their job may bring so instead of talking about real mm-hmm. topics, they'll talk about what gets clicks. Instead of discussing things like this, they're going to talk about things like, you know, crunch time. Why, you know, yeah. it's it's good, bad, you know, stay tuned for more, you know, dot, dot, dot. It's, it's, it's disturbing to see a lot of the time and it doesn't benefit them in the long run. It just downs their reputation and makes the other person feel like shit for wanting to even talk to them about it. Yeah, anything. it's... It's just so wild right now because it seems like there is literally no consequence to this type of behavior, you know, especially when you see a lot of the uh, predators that were outed during the wave of Me Too where I came forward, they all came back like it's fine, you know, like it, it feels like there's no real consequence to being a predator here. And to me, it, it was, it's very telling. Like, I do this every day. I post asking Kotaku, ta- you know, a- adding them, asking for accountability. I also get ignored every day. That says a lot, you know, because if you really cared about the issues here, if you had, if you really cared about labor and the people trapped in abusive situations and the people you write about, you would really care about making this right, which is not happening. So it really infuriates me when people congratulate them on their Me Too journalism or their journalism talking about the issues, because why are you congratulating an entity that is just as responsible for perpetuating abuse here as the abusive entity that they're writing about? You know, like it it just it's really makes me angry sometimes. You have every right to be angry because it's a kind of like. It's, I, I, I don't know if this is going to be even the right way to a, a, approach it, but it's it's kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, you've turned into a ghost all of a sudden of where there you're there, you're talking, but it's like you're in a sea of where they're not hearing you. And it's, it's I, I understand your frustration completely. And, you know, kind of, it, 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 I don't <laughs> know how we're doing this. I think we're segueing each time perfectly into the next one. I don't know how we're doing it, though. But I wonder, it, does gender matter with this? Like, the, the discussion of race and why females get the brunt of the attacks in the industry have always been a major one. But I think now, since a lot more has come out about these publications, a lot more has come out about, like, different people, it's being discussed more by a margin but it's being discussed more what, what's your take on this i think gender or being feminine presenting a gender minority definitely has something to do with it because you're already at a you're you're already a minority you're already viewed as expendable so you know that 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 has something to do with it and i feel like from how i've listened to other sexual assault survivors who've tried to out someone in this space the rape victims, I think, are even lower on the food chain, If you're, for lack of a better term. They already even, the fact that this happened to you makes you even less human to some people because it's like uh, they, they enjoy the power dynamic. I think the power dynamic means too much to them. So if you had bad things happening to you, it's somehow your fault because you're not powerful enough or you're not, like, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really twisted view of looking at, power and hierarchy and who has an advantage and who has a disadvantage and I think the fact that if you are a guy and you can rape someone get away with it and still have a career it's viewed almost like a status symbol like they they look in a weird way they look up to that and I don't I don't want to generalize but it's been so painful and it's happened so much that generalizing almost it, it seems like the fair thing to do here that men do not do anything about this other men because they view it as a a status symbol that a guy can do this. And I think women are the ones that bear the brunt of that. And it's, 
I mean, it's been very, um, a lot of this has challenged my own views or things I thought I had figured out because like Cecilia is a woman. She should know how bad this already is, but she chose to prey on us instead. You know, so it, it's kind of like the, uh, something has to be said about the women that enforce that hierarchy too, you know? It's, that's yeah, that's something that actually really shocked me as well because whenever I heard the story and whenever um, I, I saw everything come out about it, I was like, okay, are we are we sure that this woman is 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 sound minded <laughs> at all? Because this is this isn't something that normally women would do, and I see this very seldom, but I do see it happen of where like women will like take you know the side of the abuser women will you know say that oh you know they should have done this or they mm -hmm. should have done that and they always kind of make it really difficult for the woman because if a guy sees that a woman like cecilia is pushing this narrative it makes it 10 times more difficult Absolutely. for the survivor to get anything yeah, in. yeah because it only takes and one to <sighs> confirm the bias of all the other men you know sorry to interrupt it go on yeah no, no, it's fine because like I, I, I just get, I kind of see this and it's kind of like she's, you know, in a way kind of congratulating this narrative, because if she's pushing it, you know, she obviously must think this way or else she wouldn't write about it with such enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's 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 just crazy to me to think about. But yeah, as, as you were saying, I just I thought I'd say that because it's it's like what what why is this why? <laughs> yeah, you could spend a long time tugging at why and wondering why and like yeah, it's like it's such a pit. Like to me, the hope that I see in games is uh, the diversity initiatives, like the People of Color Expo, or especially that entire area, because like. It, you, if you push to diversify something, all the ugliness is going to have to be confronted. And like that, that's the only hope we have is confronting that ugliness and making it passe and not okay to do anymore. Otherwise, it's like we're going to just keep treating women or other minorities here as cannon fodder. We don't make it safe for them to be here. We don't make it easy for them to be here. And if they leave, you know, like, okay, guys, I've been way too abused. I have to leave games. All we do is Oh, I'm sorry. So sorry to hear that. I, I'm uh, good luck on your next adventures. Like it makes me so angry when I see guys coming and going. I'm so sorry to hear that. Good luck on your. Uh, yeah, that like, makes me pissed off. You, I'm just like, oh god. You, you 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 watch this person suffer. Like I get angry at the fact that I have journalists following me. They see me tweet about Kotako every day. You're watching in a way. You are kind of watching this pain happening, and no one is doing anything about it. Where. When someone writes a shitty headline, like whatever Paste magazine about this, whatever they said, Hitler and the title about cyberpunk or whatever, like it's not even worth repeating, but that got more outrage than Kotaku nearly killing sexual assault survivors just so they could write a juicy story. Why? Why is it easier to attack journalists for something that fake and dumb, but the real issue here gets completely ignored? Yeah. And this is more of a real issue than anything with cyberpunk is. I'm sorry for the people who are listening who absolutely like love the drama <laughs> that's going on with cyberpunk right now, but it's not worth discussing because at the end of the day, that is a game. Yes, money was involved and money was lost, but these are mm -hmm. lives lost. So, I mean, you know, you got to weigh your priorities here. <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's, I, I, you know, like it's really hard to have to come to terms with like, okay, so me saying this nearly cost people their lives matters less than drama around a video game like is that really where we're at like that that's the reality here right because if that weren't true you would come in and you'd be outraged like it, it it's it, like this dynamic too really is upsetting to me like when i came forward tons of people professed their support and said if you need anything from me please let me know so when kotaku did this i reached out to these people asking something basic like hey can you just retweet this and they you know it burned a bridge. They didn't want anything to do with me. They didn't want to help. It was too hard to retweet something. You're like, okay, wow. So uh, your allyship is really performative then, you know, and that's the problem here. Allyship is literally a performance just to make yourself look good. And like these were big people that built their um, platform on caring, you know, uh, standing for stuff. And just the, act, the fact that I'm asking you to retweet and, and this about Kotaku is too much where if you look uh, a past criticism of Kotaku, just dumber pretentious, we know the stupid fake drama, 
these are people that joined in and kicking Kotaku for a dumb headline. So why is it that something this serious, something this real, that has to do with real loss of human life and uh, us losing futures is too hard? You know, and it's kind of like it sends me spinning. Like, I, I, I want to understand why, but at the same time, understanding why means it's just going to bring you asking more why, you know? Yeah, exactly. And also, I, I kind of think that it's it's mm-hmm. because of money as well. I mean, everything at the end of the day in the gaming industry right now with morals yeah. revolves around money because the both butt heads constantly. Like, if you see one company, and, and I bet, you know, Kodoku is doing this so much, and I can almost guarantee that there is manipulation with money being involved because a lot of the topics that they talk about are what are the clickbait, what's going to get the most likes, what's going to get the most views. They're not talking of anything yeah. of real substance. They don't ever talk about of like the real topics that are happening. They talk about clickbait things that are happening within the society, but only because they have to. And I feel like, again, because of money, they're not going to discuss anything else. And that's just my view. That's what, you know, I've been doing this for like Mm -hmm. almost five years. And I see so much of it in the gaming industry of where you don't have enough, you know, monetary clout, then you're not going to really have much of a say. Yeah, absolutely. It It happens in indie games, too. A lot of people that say they don't care about money. And then suddenly someone gets a big deal or then they care about money and big congratulations. Like you say you don't and you say you're an underdog and you act like you stand for something. But in the grand scheme of things, you're only doing that because it makes you look good, which I think is a really short term view of money, too, because like if Kotaku took a stance, apologized, worked to make this right, wouldn't it make them look even better? Like they're the one outlet that gives a fuck and is trying to correct us. a systemic issue like it would make them look better i think it would make like why why can't you just do the right thing why why is that so hard yeah and i think it's difficult for them because they don't want to be at the forefront i think of any sort of like controversy or anything i think they're they're at the end of the day in my Mm -hmm. opinion i think they're scared to be honest with you yeah that's hard to imagine because that's to me, they are a platform with two million Twitter followers. Their high, highest journalists, including their editor in chief, is uh, has unbelievable amount of followers. Anything they say is basically true. You know, they could. Why would you? What? What? I, I don't know. Like, it's hard to find words for it. Like, you you can destroy people. You have destroyed people. You have driven sexual assault survivors to the point of suicide with how you treated them. Why, why would you why would you choose to do behave that way, you know, and where you could make such a difference? I, I know I'm kind of looping <laughs> around in circles with how, what I'm saying, but like, it, it's just unbelievable to me that you can do this to people, pretend that you stand for something, but show no regard for actually trying to fix the real issue. And I, I think it'll take a major movement of some kind in order for this to be rectified in, in to an extent. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the fact that we're doing this podcast right now, it's only a piece of the puzzle that's being put in in order to correct things slowly but surely, I believe. Yeah, the point where I'm at right now is like I, I had a lot of discussions because like me tweeting about this every day burned a lot of bridges with peers like holy shit I did not think you guys were this much cowards because like you don't even have to uh, uh, publicly support me fine you know like I understand you don't want to burn bridges with journalists because you have games you want to get reviewed okay like but why lash out at me and tell me to shut up or place the blame at me but like okay so fine I, I, I feel like I can't stop tweeting about this every day because someone has to, because it's going to hopefully prevent other people from having the same done to them, you know, if, with that awareness. Yeah, and the, I, the, that's kind of like where yeah, I'm and the people who are unfollowing and not, you know, uh, being your friend anymore, just because of this, because of you standing up for yourself, they weren't really truly people who you would want in your life anyway, because if they can't see, yeah. if they can't see something as big as this, going on then i i'm sorry to say it they're just as bad as what's happening in the industry right now Mm -hmm. yeah it it feels like a 
predatory to me. Like you just see how fundamental um, performative allyship here is. It, it, it seems in itself predatory because like you will profess support, uh, publicly act like an ally, what, but when it comes down to it, you will support the abuser. So in a way, it's kind of like allyship itself has become kind of predatory or a tactic to support the status quo, you know? And it's it's really I know I said it before, but it's kind of like being a wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, like they pretend mm -hmm. to be something yeah. that they're not. And it's it's really scary of why, like you mentioned before, we have to watch out for one another in this industry. And I feel like that's also one of the reasons why is because people will get close to us. People will get close to, you know, uh, our feelings and how we think and they'll agree and they'll be like the yes people that we really need in our lives. But then they're just kind of these people who are manipulative and want only what's good for them. I know we've discussed this across the board for this, uh, you know, taking accountability, but in your opinion, what do you think the reason is for this lack of accountability? Uh, it's, it, I, w I would almost say it's because abusers benefit them too much, so they need them more than the people they hurt. Which I can't understand because in the long run, abusers cost us so much more. Like, it's... Just taking my the creep that I came forward about, so many people had to fix his problems and fix his shit and basically write his music for him, like his brother wrote a lot of it, that it was, what's the point of keeping him on if you got to work so hard to fix this bullshit and uh, cover for him? It, it costs you so much and it costs us so much talent. He's burned so many women out and pushed them out of these amazing opportunities. And studios, people emailed me right with their horror stories about him, like a, a producer for a really big game got sick of him and fired him. Like, So we're keeping him on. Everyone agrees that he's a piece of shit and that it costs us way too much. Why are we defending him and why is it easier to come down on me then and sacrifice me just so you can keep continue to keep him? And I feel like that the entire dynamic is a lot, there's a lot of other stuff happening in games too where... For some reason, we will work so hard on letting these guys fall up and covering for them and cleaning up their act and whitewashing it for them, where in the end, it really doesn't benefit us. So I don't know, maybe it's fear, maybe it's because so many other people are abusers themselves that they think that if one of them gets pushed out, it sets too much of a precedent. So they're afraid that they can't let that, that accountability as a concept happen. I don't know. I, I feel like the, that last point might be the reality here that there's so many abusers that account the very concept of accountability and paying for what you did is what's scary so they cannot let it happen even if everyone agrees that this guy is too much and is not even benefiting the ab other abusers anymore that's a scary reality to be quite honest with you it's it's yeah. <laughs> it, there's so much of it happening that you know they they don't want to be like oh well <laughs> shit we got we got to deal with all of this right now so how do we go about this in a pc way that's actually going to take care of things legally so it's it, it's a scary reality when we look at it for what it is but I think slowly but surely, and this is <laughs> the optimistic part of me that's coming out of where, yes. <laughs> you know, of where even though this is fucked up, this is beyond fucked up, I feel like slowly but surely things will get to a good kind of homeostasis in a way of where people will start to see the veil being unlifted and they'll start to, you know, uh, kind of cancel. I hate the term canceling, but mm -hmm. the, they'll start to cancel these kind of weeds out of the bunch, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. I think optimism is what we need because it helps us dream of a better future and then work towards it. So like, yeah, you know, absolutely. And the more people speak up and the more people are like, I will not tolerate this anymore, the better it is. Like, uh, there's a event that just got, had, uh, had a bunch of stuff coming forward about it. Uh, I forgot. Uh, it, it was a big, another big indie event where the people running the show, owners of it, are extremely abusive assholes, and people spoke up, and they ended up firing everyone that spoke up. But like, okay, all that, all that aside, absolute toxicity aside, the fact that it's now costing that event, and people are saying, I, I'm, I'm removing myself from this event, I will not work with there anymore. That event doesn't have a future anymore. So in a way that 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 it, it proves constantly it shows that speaking up makes a difference because if they cannot rectify their abuse and they cannot fix their harm, 
they're going to just go down with the ship they think that they own and they're in control of. So if games and game journalism cannot rectify its abuse and it cannot fix its harm, it's just going to go down. It, 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 it will have to make room for other things that are better because that, that's just that's just how things work. People at itself, people are sick of being abused, so they're not going to really tolerate that anymore. It might not be the people in charge, the big people, the fancy people with the clout that see this, but everyone else that counts as the bulk of people are, are sick of this shit, you know? And that, that that's the people that really matter, the the little people that make up what games are. That, those are the people that matter. And like, to me, that's, that's where the hope is, is the people being sick of this shit and just not tolerating and not supporting it anymore. Like I get, I get a lot of hope from seeing assholes fall, and it's happened already. You know, there's been a <laughs> few, few instances where they did fall hard on their ass. Like and like, okay, if it can happen for that, it can happen for anywhere else. It can happen for abusive journalists. Like we, we, you just cannot tolerate shit anymore, and that that's what we have to just believe in. Exactly, and I, I feel like it, it will happen. It will. It'll take time. It'll. It, you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not being like unrealistic about that. It'll take a lot of time, mm -hmm. but it's something that's not impossible. You know. Yeah. And to go into the final topic because the podcast is coming to a close. Unfortunately, I really do like talking <laughs> with you about these topics because they really need to be said. Yeah, um, thank you. Th this is one of the things of where I think is the major focal point of the conversation because it's something that whenever you were on that podcast discussing the topic of off the record, it made me kind of have this like epiphany in my head of where it's true there is no such a thing as off the record anymore because mm -hmm. people use it to their advantage. And I want to know, um, you know, this is used to kind of manipulate in a way survivors and others who are coming forward. I, I would love to get your opinions on like this concept of traditional journalism and what off the record really like means to you in the sense well at, fir at first i think it's absolutely ridiculous that if i didn't say the magic word now i'll get fucked over like just that as a concept is it's, it's stupid okay like get o get over yourself like i i have to say off the record for you oh, okay like like it's, it's so dumb like and learn learn the rules of consent maybe and that if you will publish something, it can horribly ruin someone's future and will to live. Like, okay, like that, that should matter to you as a journalist first and foremost. And I will die on the hill that I shared that in the second phone call and I'm telling the truth that it, it, it was for the lawyer. And also just the way, like I, the last post I wrote where we were talking about Cecilia and what she did to the other story, it, it's the same thing of, um, one of the survivors didn't want to be involved, but they they had written a blog post about the situation for the creep that they, you know they were they were fighting with, and uh, Cecilia wanted to quote it. She didn't want uh, the person didn't want to have the post be involved whatsoever, so they took the post down. Cecilia said, "Well, it was public record," and then went looking through old tweets, and the person locked their account, saying, "No, stop!" Like basically, I, I'm paraphrasing heavily, but it's on my blog. And uh, Cecilia then dug up old tweets where it looked like this person was kind of flirting with the abuser, like, haha, I'm gonna get you, like, and pu published that. And like, okay, so you know this person did not wanna get drug into this very public thing that's gonna be posted on a website with two million Twitter followers, and you still did it. And you, uh, the person told Cecilia that this was gonna hurt them, and, they st and Cecilia still did, and Cecilia, got them to talk about uh, their abuser uh, kind of promising off the record where that was again muddled and it was publicized anyway. And uh, then another person from that same uh, story that Cecilia talked to almost had a suicide attempt for what Cecilia forced them to relive. So like that, that the way you just forced yourself into these people's lives and you took advantage of what is public and what is not public and completely disrespected their will to be kept out of it. That, that that is so malicious because now their name is publicly associated with with you know rape uh, and abuse allegations very publicly for the rest of their life and that is dangerous because the dynamic now happens where an employer looks at that and they lose prospective jobs which happen in this case too so you drug people out very vulnerable people who do not have a platform they do not have tons of twitter followers they do not have clout 
you took advantage of them. They're in a position where they can't they can't even speak up about it because you're so much bigger than them. Like you are the abuser that you are writing about. You are just as bad because you used this huge platform to hurt these people just so you could write something, just so it could make you look righteous. That 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 off the record and on the record does not matter here. That is secondary to the actual be- issue the problematic behavior here of not respecting someone that's extremely vulnerable and too small to speak up and just slaughtering their story and their truth just so you could write something that you're going to send to your next employer so you can get a job at Wired or whatever. Like that, that's, that's the issue. So to me, arguing what is and isn't record is like, okay, that's fine. I'm happy that exists, but what's the point of having that exist if you can't even honor it, if it means nothing to you? This is true. This is, yeah, this is, I mean, it's it's a good point to bring up because back in the day when journalism was actually taken seriously, <laughs> um, it was something of where you you honored that. It was kind of like a code, you know, like you have the Hippocratic Oath and you have off the record in journalism mm-hmm. speak, you know, you, you, you honored that. And I feel like that isn't honored anymore because of money, because yeah. of clout, because of everything that's being brought into it. And it's, it, it's weird to see because like personally, whenever I go in, and for example, when I have to write a review on something that I know is going to be tricky to write about, I almost like, you know, and this is for, you know, not like a, a pity thing or anything like that. I'm just saying this kind of like as an experience type thing of what I've noticed over the course of the years of writing these things, I will literally get anxiety before I have to publish something. I don't know. I feel like it would help a lot of the discussion if we also heard uh, how it's like for game journalists, just the reality of that scene, you know, because that's when bridge building could happen. Because to me, it's like, after my experiences, and like, I mean, I wrote, the wrote, most recent blog post I wrote, I feel like is a pretty definite summary of Cecilia's journalism, you know, uh, where I talk about what she did to these other people. But like, I was so angry about what happened. To me, it became really easy to kind of just be angry at all game journalists now like you all are just evil and like dragging people out like there's what like what's wrong with you like how can how can this matter so little to you like because it really does hurt like it it really fucks you up just the the entire thing to be thrown into and be forced to survive now you know like i feel like if other game journalists just there were more more discussion for the realities of that scene it it would help and kind of building bridges and kind of rectifying how, how to go forward from here on out and creating better standards for lack of a better term. And, and I hope that at some points, you know, game the journalism scene you can earn your respect back because it's supposed to be a place where <laughs> people are supposed to give, you know, great reviews, great this, great that, you know, un- but the, the key term here is unbiased because whenever people go into like more biased type of reviews, whether they're angry reviews or what Cecilia has done, it becomes very, very dangerous, mm-hmm. I feel. And I feel like since those are the reviews that are pushed the most, that's all that people are going to see. And that's the kind of reputation that unfortunately it's going to have because people won't see the reviews of where like, um, you know, let's say for example, you're reviewing a wrestling game and there's a, you know, an optimistic kid in Kentucky who <laughs> wants to write like a wrestling review. They're not going to see those reviews, you know, ever. They're going to see the ones that, you know, Cecilia writes that Kodoko pushes, you know, the really clout worthy ones. And that's the kind of like the mold that we have to break here. I yeah. Feel. Yeah, it's like every every corner of this industry, from journalism to game dev to AAA, has shit they, that really needs to be addressed. It needs to be confronted and torn down, and just it it, it can't stand anymore. Just because the amount of people we're sacrificing to this poison, it's it's not worth it. No, it's not. It's not. And if something doesn't change, there's going to be more people in hiding for fear that you know the uh, just for their life yeah. basically and it's not it's not fair to put people through that you know like if you're gonna write a piece about someone you know you have to again i always say this we have to make sure that they're safe you know that they're you know understood and that people don't go attacking them you know the the amount of hate that i saw you get that i saw other people getting was just obscene and disgusting for what for coming f- forward about 
something yeah. that you were saying. And the one thing that could have fixed it would have been good journalism. Like, I, it's just, it, the other day it really hit me because I started getting more uh, death threat, whatever, a wave of harassment. And I think it's because, the, well, I know it's because the narrative of, I came forward, now this guy killed himself, That that got, that's ingrained. That's the reality that ended up being adopted. Not the fact that I came forward, here's the story of who I came forward about. Like, a lot of the journalists that wrote about this and pushed that narrative, I, I'd be surprised if they even read the blog post. They didn't even link back to it. It's like they, they listened to their own echo chamber of what journalists said what instead of actually going to the source of where this came from. And like just pushing the narrative of, I came forward, now a guy's dead. Like that empowers some very dangerous people to feel righteous about coming after me, where this is not even the truth that you're pushing, yet you still push it. And what does it say to other survivors that they shouldn't come forward? Otherwise, it's going to kill the kill uh, the abuser. And then it, it kind of makes me question, well, why do you not care about the safety and the life of the survivor? Why is the abuser so much more valuable and important and worth keeping than the survivor who's fighting with suicidal ideation because of what happened to them? It's like it's the priorities here are extremely fucked up to me. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering too. Like, why why is the abuser more important than the survivor, especially when it comes to like, you know, male or female, like kind of that role, like uh, that gender role that we mm-hmm. were discussing earlier. Like, why why does it ma- like matter? Like, if someone abused someone, the abuser should get the punishment. It's yeah. simple logic. It's got to be some consequence, but no, the consequence is always on the person that speaks up. You know, like that's it. it there's that's where it stops and. Yeah, it's it's got to change. It's it's just so tired. Like I, I give talk, I give a talk at Indicate about you know what we can do about abuse in our communities. The amount of people afterwards that came up to me, like some teary eyed, talking about their own story. Like the people have been affected by abuse here. They're crying. It's hard for them to speak about it. You know, like it. It's so so many people here. It, it are so traumatized. Like. Why are we keeping these assholes when we have people that are literally crying and shaking at the end of a talk, sharing their their own story? You know, like it it's so inexcusable to me. You're keeping dangerous people and platforming them so they can continue to hurt people like this. And for what? Like God, what's so magical about their work that the other people that they're hurting can't do too? Yeah, and it's it's yeah, it's there. They get treated as the be all end all. Yeah. I do have to say, it's been so wonderful getting to talk to you about this. I really, honestly hope that people really open up and really wake up to these concepts because people can't afford to be afraid of talking yeah. about this anymore. It's too dangerous to stay quiet. It's too dangerous to let anything go past our eyes. You know, and it's one of those things of where I'm so grateful that, you know, when I messaged you and I th- I thought, oh, God, she's not going to want to do a podcast. I got nervous and I'll be completely honest with you, like going on today's podcast, I was so nervous. But seeing how everything turned out and seeing how well we were able to get not only your story across, but the message that accountability is necessary. I think it's yeah, going to be helpful yeah, for a the, lot of the people. The more something this can get out there better. And thank you so much for having me. It really meant a lot that you invited me and stuff because like it, it can feel like you're all alone in fighting this. So when someone extends help like this, it, it's huge to me. So thank you. Any And you know, and anything that anyone can do is yeah. just speak up not be afraid to just speak your words speak your as as overused as this term is speaking your truth and honestly going in with no regrets that's the baseline of Mm -hmm. fighting everything i feel so to end this podcast on a a kind of just like more of a gamey note because i feel like i have to put some sort of game related (laughs) thing in in here um i do want to know for those people who are listening and well actually just listening because you can't watch this because there's no video haha on you guys but to know what your game recommendation is because i feel like you might have some good game recommendations oh yeah uh so you should check out Utopias by AAA Art Software on itch. Or there's another one that I just totally fell in love with called Juice World. Like just search itch for Juice World. It's the most bizarre and weirdest. I, I don't know how to describe it. It's just an amazing experience. And like, 
Itch has so many cool horror games. Like you, you got you got to check that space out. It, it's it's like it's making me crazy about how amazing it is. Like it's it's like I fell into a rabbit hole of beautiful, amazing work. So just like jump into Itch and check out all these amazing horror game creators. It's beautiful. The indie game scene yes. has just been blossoming, <laughs> and I love it so much. <laughs> I love seeing it so much. One game that I would recommend, honestly, for everyone to check out, it's a little bit more of an unknown game, unfortunately. It deserves more attention, is Franbo. It's so good. I'll have to it's check so that good. out. <laughs> and enjoy. And also, be sure to check out her social medias. Natalie's stuff will be down in the description below. Well, if you guys are watching this on YouTube, because I always think in terms of YouTube, I don't think it's in terms of Spotify yet, so bear with me, you guys. But for anybody who wants to check out Natalie's stuff, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, all of her stuff will be down in the description below for your viewing pleasure. And if you guys like my face and what I do, please be sure to subscribe. Hit the bell down below because I make videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And as always, stay casually nerdy. I'll see you all in the next video and in the next podcast. Peace, you guys.